Congratulations, Question Oral, the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Il nous faut rétablir la confiance. We have to regain trust in our democracy after it has been shattered by Beijing's interference, and that is the reason for which I have already spoken to other opposition leaders and a government minister regarding a public inquiry. The Conservative Party is ready to share nonpartisan names that would be acceptable for all members of parliament. The second, the Prime Minister will announce a public inquiry. Will he do it right here and right now? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as we have said from the very beginning, foreign interference should not be a partisan affair. And that is why the Minister for Intergovernmental Affairs in the next few days will continue to consult experts, legal experts, and opposition parties in order to define the next steps to follow and the person best placed to lead these operations. Until then, we'll continue our efforts to fight foreign interference in our democracy, as we have done since we arrived in power. We hope that opposition parties will deal with this as seriously as we do. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Après huit ans. After eight years of this Prime Minister, Canadians are suffering, suffering because of his promises and because of his actions. Émilie Choquette wrote uh, one uh, wrote a letter to the Journal de Montréal saying that one a family had to sell their home because they couldn't keep up with their mortgage payments. Their payments had gone up from $2,300 to $3,700, so they will no doubt have to lose their house because of the inflationist policies of this government. Will the Prime Minister reverse on that decision? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are the government that implemented tangible measures to uh, help families like Emily's family. It is the Conservative Party that systematically voted against help for dental care that will help young children and will help families, help for low-income renters, help for groceries. These are tangible investments that we're doing right now to help families weather the storm while we build a stronger and more resilient economy with good jobs in the years to come, whilst we're investing in housing. Le chef de the Prime Minister claimed that the government would take on debt so that Canadians wouldn't have to, forgetting, of course, that it's Canadians who pay all of that debt through their taxes. And now they're paying it because they have the biggest household debt of any country in the G7. In fact, Family debt in Canada is bigger than our entire economy, prompting our banking regulator today to force banks to take on more of a rainy day fund to face down future defaults that they expect will rise as a result of growing interest rates. The Prime Minister's inflationary policies are driving up interest rates on Canadian mortgage holders. Will you balance the budget to bring down inflation and interest rates so Canadians can keep their homes? Here, here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are struggling, and that's why we continue to step up with investments to help them out uh, with dental care, uh, with support for low-income renters, and investments in housing, investments uh, in supporting families. Uh, so at the same time uh, that the Conservative uh, Party is con proposing cuts and austerity, we're continuing to invest. But if the, the Leader of the Opposition really wants to come clean with Canadians, we'll Will he talk about whether he's going to cut child care for families or yeah. dental care for children or better health care services? These are the things that he will be cutting, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The Prime Minister, is, after eight years, is imposing austerity on Canadians. I just told the story in French of a Quebec family who's seen their mortgage payments rise by 64 percent. She's making, the, the mother of that family is living austerity by having to cut back on her expenses and probably move into a tiny apartment as a result of his inflationary spending. Even his finance minister admits that deficits drive inflation, and inflation drives higher interest rates on families just like this one. Will he reverse his deficits, balance the budget to bring down inflation and interest rates so Canadians can keep their homes? Here, here. Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the 
opposition is proposing cuts in supports to Canadians, at the same time as Canada actually has the lowest deficit in the G7, the best debt-to-GDP ratio of the G7, and we've preserved our AAA credit rating, and that's so that we can continue to be there to support Canadians with investments in them, in their families, in housing, in the kinds of supports that the leader of the opposition would cut. So he's uh, just continuing his attacks to try and distract from the underwhelming election results he got last night. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, what is overwhelming is the debt that he has imposed on the backs of hardworking Canadians. Canadians who now face the loss of their homes as a result of his inflationary policies. After eight years, the cost of rent has doubled. After eight years, the cost of a mortgage payment has doubled. After eight years, the needed down payment for the average house has doubled. And now, because of the massive mortgages that he told Canadians would be consequence-free, that they now hold and now pay higher interest rates on, many could lose their homes. Will he reverse these inflationary policies so that Canadians can keep their homes? Yeah. The right Honourable Prime Minister. You see how quickly he pivoted away from uh, the disastrous by-election results they got last night. Uh, the fact of the matter is we're going to continue to stay focused on investing in Canadians, on putting forward a positive vision of this country that's resonating from COVID. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going, to, I'm going to interrupt the Prime Minister. Now, I want to remind the honourable members that this morning there was a dust-up over name-calling and shouting, and after discussions or after hearing a point of order, I really expected everything to be calm, and it started off that way. So I'm going to ask both sides to not... I, mean, I feel silly standing up here asking you not to call each other names or to yell at each other. But, anyways, I'll let the Prime Minister continue. You have uh, the Honourable Mon Prime Minister has 20, 20 seconds left. Put forward a positive vision for Canadians for the future, here, here. investing in great jobs, investing in fighting climate change, supporting families through the challenging times they're in right now, while the Conservative Party continues to promote cuts, division and anger. Uh, we're going to continue with a positive vision for the future, here, here. Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, we are prepared to give the government the benefit of the doubt. Its plan to avoid at all costs a public and independent commission of inquiry into Chinese interference was not, let us say, a great success. His strategy of giving himself a special, a very special rapporteur reporting strictly to the Prime Minister has, as they say, gone rather badly wrong. After that, we saw a sudden openness on the part of the Minister for Intergovernmental Affairs to a public inquiry. But the session is drawing to a close, Mr. Speaker, and frankly, we're beginning to think that the House and the media are being fooled. What are they waiting to trigger this commission? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, after the opposition turned this into a partisan affair with uh, personal barbs against the former Governor General, what we did, we offered collaborative work where everyone will be able to uh, contribute that will not finish in acrimonious and partisan debate. And that is exactly why we are discussing with various parties for a positive step forward so that we can all take this issue very seriously that we have taken seriously since the very beginning as a government. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, the bloc has held its head high since the beginning. This is a strategy as old as time. Fine words to appease the opposition until the end of the session, in the hopes that the media attention will be elsewhere in the fall. Especially since they could try to convince the good friends in the NDP to settle for a parliamentary committee during the summer instead of a real commission of inquiry. A classic, Mr. Speaker. Vintage. You need a commission of inquiry now, with a speaker appointed now a chair voted on now by the House. No parliamentary messing around, no poorly carried out work. It's happening now. The ball is in their court. What are they waiting for? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, after the partisan games played by the other parties over the last few months, we are here to work with them in collaboration and this in order to show that we can all take this very seriously. And that is why we are working with them now in order to establish the next steps to follow 
We have always taken this very seriously from the very beginning, and we will continue to take it very seriously, irrespective of opposition partisan games. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Countless affordability studies warn of the repercussions when people have to spend more than 30% of their income on rent. But in Toronto, over 40% of people exceed that amount. Things are getting very, very difficult for Canadians. While corporate landlords are making massive profits, Canadians are struggling. When will this Prime Minister understand that we are on the verge of a catastrophe? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. We know Canadians are struggling with the costs of housing, whether it's a young family looking to buy their first home or a student struggling to pay their rent. That's why we've been taking action on many fronts. We're helping Canadians save up for their first home. We're investing in building and repairing more homes, including through supporting local governments to fast-track the creation of 100,000 new homes. We're providing support for low-income renters. We're ensuring houses are used as homes by curbing unfair practices that drive up pri pr prices, including foreign home buyers ban and federal anti-flipping rule. We will continue to support Canadians challenged with housing. Well, member for Burnaby South. The Prime Minister and the Liberal government are not responding with the urgency that Canadians need. Le premier ju the 1st of July is fast approaching, and in Quebec, July 1st is not only Canada Day, it's also Moving Day. 314 families in need have contacted the Municipal Housing Office in Montreal to report a loss of accommodation. The city expects to have to provide emergency accommodation for approximately 40 families. Will this government, will this Prime Minister finally realize the stress under which all of these families are? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we continue to be there with programs and projects to uh, help this housing crisis throughout the country. Our plan includes collaborating with municipalities by investing $4 billion to accelerate approvals for house building, creating 100,000 new housing units. We are bridging in investments in infrastructure and housing. We're helping Canadians to save in order to buy their first house. We offer assistance to low-income renters. Surplus federal lands are being also reinvested. Oh. Speaker, the Minister of Public Safety peddled fiction on his rifle hunting ban. He peddled fiction to a judge. He peddled fiction to the families of the victims of a murderer and a serial rapist. It's either gross incompetence or it's a deliberate attempt by his own staff to protect the minister with plausible deniability. Both seem to be a pattern in this government. They don't read emails. They don't get brief. They don't know anything. So how many times can one minister peddle fiction in his or her portfolio until the prime minister fires somebody? in this government, or maybe the direction is coming from the top. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I'll tell you what's reckless to public safety. When you have a Conservative Party of Canada who proposes to make AR-15 style firearms illegal again, on this side of the House, we propose to ban them and buy them back to protect our communities. What's reckless, Mr. Speaker, is when you either introduce legislation that is unconstitutional or just filibuster it. That's what's reckless to public safety. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we put forward legislation that is there to protect Canadians. We do it in a way that's constitutional. That's my focus. That's the focus of this government. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, you think at this point he'd stop peddling fiction. He knows that the minister can mandate that offenders like Bernardo can be kept in maximum security. Not the individual, but a class of the most horrific offenders. They know that they can stop it and do something about, about the transfer, like the last Conservative government did in 2013. The minister actually discussed options with his own staff but he didn't do anything, and he knew for three months. And now they're saying they have a brand-new system in place that will tell them what's happening in their own ministers, in, in their own ministries. They owe the families an explanation, but at the very least, he owes this House a resignation. The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. It is preposterous to hear the Conservatives continue to stand up when their record is one of cuts. In their last year of government, Mr. Speaker, in 2014 and 15, they cut $300 million from the Correctional Service of Canada. We put that money back. We continue to invest in that institution so that we can protect Canadians, Mr. Speaker. And that is our focus, protecting Canadians. The Conservatives can go on with cuts. They can go on with filibusterings. Canadians will see that through all of that. On this side of the House, we'll continue to focus on protecting Canadians. 
The Honourable Member for Calgary Midnapore. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are wondering why this Prime Minister hasn't done more to safeguard our democratic systems. We know that he was briefed on foreign interference six times in the last five years. We know that members in this very House have been intimidated by Beijing. And we know that on two occasions, this House has directed the Prime Minister to have a public inquiry on foreign interference. So will he commit to having a public inquiry on foreign interference today? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we have always taken the issue of foreign interference seriously. That is precisely why, since our government was elected, we put in place measures to strengthen our democratic institutions. We're continuing to work with opposition parties because Canadians expect all people in this place to put partisanship aside and put the values of protecting our democracy at the forefront. Mr. Speaker, members opposite can laugh, but we take foreign interference very seriously. Very much. Very much. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Minnipore. Mr. Speaker, it's evident they don't take it seriously. After eight years, this Prime Minister has yet to call a public inquiry into foreign interference. In fact, he continues to stand in the way, enjoy the status quo, because it benefits the Liberals. Seven months and all he did was appoint a special rapporteur, one who had to resign as a result of a conflict of interest. Right. Seven months, two votes in Parliament, just, and no public inquiry. Will he stand up today, support a public inquiry on foreign interference, yes or no? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. It's really disappointing to see the Conservatives back to their partisan games when it comes to foreign interference. The Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs has been consulting with all parties in this place because we want to get to a place where Canadians can have trust in these institutions, where we can tone down the political rhetoric. Mr. Speaker, I'm very disappointed to, to see the Conservatives with their personal attacks instead of rolling up this, their sleeves and getting to work to ensure that all Canadians have trust in their democratic institutions. That's precisely what we're focused on, and we're not going to be distracted by partisan games. Here, here. <laughs> the Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Lizette Chamalévy. Mr. Speaker, for weeks we have been calling for a public inquiry into the Chinese Communist regime's interference in our country's affairs. The many stories that have been made public are worrying. For example, members of this House and their families have been the victims of a campaign of intimidation. That isn't nothing, Mr. Speaker. No one can explain why the government is turning a deaf ear to requests from this chamber to shed light on this interference. What is preventing the Prime Minister from launching a public inquiry? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, the Minister for Intergovernmental Affairs is having very positive discussions with the opposition on the matter. We will find the best way to move forward to engage with Canadians and consult them to have a constructive dialogue how we can build our work on foreign interference. We need to stop it with partisan games. We need to stop it with squabbling. That's what the Conservatives want. On this side, we will continue to work to protect our institutions. The Honourable Member for Belchasse, Les Etchemins Lévis. Well, I don't think I'm squabbling with anyone. Oh, another worrying subject, Mr. Speaker. Paul Bernardo was allowed to leave his maximum security prison and go to a more lenient prison, this despite his horrific crimes. But we know that the Minister for Public Safety has the power to prevent this transfer. He can issue directives to that effect and has already done so in the past. Yet he refuses to do so. This adds to his long list of poor decisions. Does the Prime Minister still have confidence in his Minister for Public Safety? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, when I was told on the 30th of May that uh, Mr. Bernardo was going to be transferred, I took concrete steps immediately by communicating with the Commission. Now there is an inquiry happening. I also published new instructives and directives to the Department in order to make sure that victims will be informed and before this kind of decision is made in the future and will continue to make investments necessary to protect our communities. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Longueuil Saint Hubert. Mr. Speaker, for Quebecers, July 1st is not a holiday, it's a nightmare. With a week and a half to go, hundreds of Quebecers don't know where they're going to live in the middle of a housing crisis. There is a shortfall of 50,000 social housing units in Quebec. Just imagine, and the Parliamentary Budget Officer concluded already in 2021 that if we rely on Ottawa's funding, there won't be any more. 
The federal strategy is a failure that is struggling to maintain the status quo. In other words, there'll be no more housing available tomorrow than there is today. Faced with a housing crisis, when will this government finally launch an actual effort for this crisis? The Honourable Minister for Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, the Bloc Québécois is saying that the 1st of July is a nightmare. Well, I take that as an insult to Canada. This is a country that is celebrated throughout the world, a country where we can live with dignity, where governments are here to support their society, a country that is in solidarity, where we can help each other. We can be different, but be equal, and we can cohabitate, cohabitate together. I know that the Bloc Québécois wants, wants to get rid of Canada, but Canada will always be there today and tomorrow, even if they don't like it on the Bloc side. The Honourable Member for Longueuil, Saint-Hubert. Mr. Speaker, I asked the Minister to uh, walk around Longueuil on the 1st of July to see if it's a dream or a nightmare. Their investments are just enough to maintain the status quo. Just that, there, there is no more affordable housing than before. Tell that to the families of Greater Montreal who are competing with the federal government for the same increasingly expensive housing. Tell that to the people of Rimouski, Grand Bay, Drummond, with a 0.4% vacancy rate. If you find a place there, you're lucky enough to buy a lottery ticket as well. Mr. Speaker, this housing crisis is unprecedented. When is the federal government going to invest to finally tackle this crisis? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. What I would have to say to him is that I went throughout Quebec recently, and I'm very much aware of vacancy rates. And that is exactly the reason for which we have created an accelerator fund for municipalities. And they are over the moon to have this fund. They will be able to immediately apply to this fund. And we will continue to be here to increase affordable housing in Canada. The Honourable Member for Longueuil saint hubert Mr. Speaker, low supply in the rental market has disproportionately affected low-income tenants. It isn't the blocky request saying this is a quote from the CMHC in its annual report. The federal, the federal corporation itself has noted that the federal strategy is abandoning the least well-off. We, when it comes to housing, we need the we need one percent more, not housing reserved for the one percent. One percent of federal revenues and income invested in housing, with Quebec's share transferred to build social and community housing. In the midst of a housing crisis, one percent isn't asking for too much, is it? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to remind the Honourable Member that housing is provincial. And we are very happy to be able to work hand in hand with provinces and municipalities, as opposed to this party on the other side of the House that insults municipalities. We want to work hand in hand with all municipalities and all stakeholders in order to deliver the housing that everyone needs, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. L'Honorable, the Honourable Member for Battle River Crowfoot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. From big cities to small towns, everyone is paying the price of Liberal inflationary deficits. After eight years of that Prime Minister's spending, Canadians are feeling the pain. And the devastating reality is that those Liberal policies are the direct cause of Canadians' hardship, resulting in record food bank usage and housing becoming unaffordable for regular Canadians. And Liberals propped up by the NDP just poured another $60 billion of fuel on the inflationary fire. When will that Prime Minister end his inflationary spending so Canadians can keep their homes and afford the basics. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Tourism. Speaker, last night voters in Winnipeg, in Montreal, and in historic numbers in Oxford showed up to vote against the reckless austerity, partisan populism, and ugly American-style attacks of the Conservative Party. You know, thousands of Canadians, Mr. Speaker, looked at the Twitter attacks, the video stunts, and the artful alliterations of the Conservative leader, and they saw it for what it was, Mr. Speaker. They opted to support a real plan to support Canadians to invest in communities and build an economy that works for everyone. The Honourable Member for Battle River Crowfoot. 
So, Mr. Speaker, I believe that uh, these the, that there were two Conservatives that were successful yesterday, and increasingly from across the country, we are hearing from Canadians that are hurting. Mortgages have doubled, rent has doubled, and Mr. Speaker, Canadians are visiting food banks in record numbers. And one has to ask, what is the cause of this pain? Well, Mr. Speaker, experts agree that the cause is this Liberal government's inflationary spending. Mr. Speaker, my question is simple to that minister. Will he rein in this deficit spending that is causing inflation? Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Tourism. Speaker, what the member opposite said is completely false, and you are a fantastic referee, Mr. Speaker, but let's bring in an international referee on the health of Canada's economy in a report today from the International Monetary Fund that has said that Canada has, wait for it, Mr. Speaker, an enviable fiscal position, the best fiscal position in the G7. Mr. Speaker, don't take it from us, take it from the IMF. It means that we can invest in Canadians, grow the economy, stabilize health care, and not take any lessons from the Conservative Austerity Caucus. Before we go to the next question, I just want to point out that we started off really well and it seems to be deteriorating. So I just want to ask everyone to take a deep breath. And it's, it's almost like a rumble in the background. So, and I, I, and I also want to point out, it's nice to see both sides talking to each other, but don't shout across the floor. Just go over and talk to each other, either one way or the other. The Honourable Member for Battleford Westminster. Thank you very much, Matt, uh, Mr. Speaker. After eight years, Liberal-driven inflation is costing Canadians. The Prime Minister's massive deficit spending has caused record inflation and resulted in repeated interest rate hikes. Can Canada's housing market is now the most at risk of any developed country. At, and the latest rate hike is devastating for the nearly half of all homeowners who are already struggling to keep up with their mortgage payments. Mr. Speaker, will the Prime Minister stop spending so that Canadians can keep a roof over their head? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. You know, Mr. Speaker, what the member seems to be talking about are things that we are doing for Canadians, like the Canada Child Benefit, the Canada's Worker Benefit, the Climate Action Initiative, dental care, rental care, grocery rebates. Mr. Speaker, one thing we know is that this government since 2015 has had Canadians' backs. And when it comes to affordability, what speaks more than child care? We're glad that the NDP, Conservatives, Bloc Québécois and Greens all voted together to make life more affordable for Canadian families through child care and a publicly managed, primarily not-for-profit system that benefits our children, families and Canadians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, member for Battleford's Lloyd Minster. Well, Mr. Speaker, even the Liberal Finance Minister has admitted that her government's deficit spending is fueling inflation, but they just keep pouring fuel on the inflationary fire. And after eight years, Canadians cannot afford it. The more that these Liberals spend, the more costs go up and the more unaffordable it is for Canadians to feed and house their families. Canadians need the Liberals to finally show some restraint. When will the Prime Minister end his inflationary spending so that Canadians can finally feel some relief? <laughs> the Honourable Minister for Sport. Mr. Speaker, Canadians remember what the Conservative solution was before 2015. When times are tough and there's economic uncertainty, their solution is to cut, cut, cut. And when they cut, those who suffer are the most vulnerable and who are the most in need. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we will always be there to help those who need it, be it with dental care, be it with daycare fees, or all the other measures that we have in, in stored since we came to power in 2015. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a new study from the Breakfast Club Canada shows that 84 percent of Canadians want a national school meal program implemented immediately. The Liberals promised to create the program two years ago, but they still haven't delivered. Meanwhile, schools are cutting services that feed kids because they can't afford to pay for the program because of the rising cost of food. When will the Liberals keep their promise and implement a national school meal program? Here, here. 
The Honorable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we know that times are tough for Canadian families right now, and we know that we need to ensure that our most vulnerable, our children, are protected. That's why, Mr. Speaker, since 2015, we've been working to reduce child poverty and support the families who need it the most. We've done it through the Child Canada Benefit. We've done it through other measures, including affordability and child care. And we will continue to work, Mr. Speaker. We know that the school food programs are important, and that's why we continue to work together across the aisle to ensure that we meet the needs of Canadian children. Thank you. Well done. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Griesbach. Edmonton now has one of the fastest growing monthly rent prices in the country, increasing nearly 16% over the last year. Young people can't keep up and Liberals aren't doing anything. They won't protect young people from corporate landlords who are handing out eviction notices to jack up the rent. They are not invest properly into building affordable units and they're leaving young people to fend for themselves while corporate landlords keep getting richer. Mr. Speaker, will the Liberals invest in safe, affordable, community based housing so young people can actually afford to rent in Edmonton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Honourable Minister. The, Secretary. the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I thank my colleague for his question. Indeed, across the country, Canadians are struggling to pay rent or even to find housing for themselves that they can afford. We have committed to building more housing units faster but also we're going to crack down on rent evictions. Thank you, Madam Speaker, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Madawaska, Restigouche. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The modernization of the Official Languages Act has just passed third reading in the Senate. In my opinion, this is a major step towards the substantive equality of our two official languages. Could the Minister tell us what advancements this legislation will allow in order to better support official language minority communities, promoting our two official languages and protecting French from coast to coast to coast? The Honourable Official Languages Minister. Mr. Speaker, good news. The Senate just confirmed royal assent for Bill C-13. I'm very proud of the work we have accomplished to modernize the Official Languages Act. With this act, we will have better tools to halt the decline of French and to better protect our official language minority communities. Among other things, this law will require the adoption of a Francophone immigration policy, it will strengthen the powers of the Commissioner of Official Languages, and it will give new tools to OLMCs to ensure their vitality. Mr. Speaker, it's a great day for official languages. Member for Foothills. After eight years of this government, Canadian farmers are literally paying for the Liberals' carbon tax failures. Canadian farmers will pay $150,000 a year in carbon taxes alone, but the Liberals haven't hit a single emissions target. So what's better than making farmers pay for one failed carbon tax? How about two? On July 1st, the Liberals are introducing a second carbon tax. will increase the price of feed, fuel and fertilizer, which will also drive up the cost of food at the grocery store. With more than 8 million Canadians already relying on a food bank every single month, my question to the government is how many farmers are going to go bankrupt, how many Canadians will go hungry paying for another failed carbon tax? The Honourable Minister for Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, my colleague is twisting the facts. He's talking about a typical farm of 5,000 acres, but the average farm in Canada is 809 acres, and he is assuming that agriculture producers will do nothing to reduce emissions, but they're working very hard on that. They're among the first to try to adopt good practices, new technology, get the information, and we're helping them with $1.5 billion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The minister isn't denying that Canadian farmers are being punished with two carbon taxes. And in fact, they're face facing the highest inflation rates in 40 years. And nowhere is that more acute with the price of food, which is already up 10%. But rather than offering support for Canadians, the Liberals are doubling down with a second carbon tax. What that will do is we are seeing forecasts that food prices will go up another 34 percent over the next two years, adding another $5,000 to Canadians' annual food, food costs. Again, to the government, when they introduce a second carbon tax, how many farmers will go broke and how many Canadians will go hungry? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. If the, if the member from across would really like to talk about the clean fuel regulations, let's talk about that. It's kind of interesting because Alberta itself has clean fuel regulations. And what does it do? It actually incents like, cleaner fuels 
but it also works to support emerging industries like biofuels, which I think are quite popular in his part of the country as well. What we are doing, it's not just a regulation, there are incentives and there are supports to make sure that we have an all-encompassing program. It's not only going to reduce emissions, but it's also going to create new industries and new renewable fuels that are so important for our future. The Honourable Ren Member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Speaker, it's official Liberal policy to make energy more expensive. It takes energy to manufacture fertilizer. It takes energy to ship fertilizer to uh, the farmers. It takes energy to spread fertilizer. It takes energy to harvest crops. It takes energy to ship crops to processors. It takes energy to process crops into food. It takes energy to ship the food to stores. Why doesn't the Prime Minister understand that higher energy prices lead to higher food prices and forcing Canadians to go hungry? The Honourable Agriculture Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When the with the clean technology program, that's 500 million of investment in clean technology. One of the newest innovations that can be deployed across country is using manure as energy, and there's a lot of potential for that. We will continue to support agriculture in these ways. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, the government has no plan to make food more affordable. The multiple carbon taxes and the tariff on fertilizers have only increased the price of food from farm to table. The cost of production in Canada continues to rise, and farmers have been utterly abandoned by this government. As we saw in the last budget, less than 1 percent of the budget was allocated to agriculture. The Liberals are overlooking a major economic driver. When will the government take real action to support farmers and to make production more affordable? The Honourable Agriculture Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think my colleague should perhaps look at the history of what the last Conservative government did. They cut hundreds of millions in risk management programs. They cut hundreds of millions in research and innovation. Mr. Speaker, our government has invested. We increased by 500 million the Sustainable Agriculture Partnership. We have invested in clean tech, clean practices, and research and innovation to help agriculture be more resilient. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Jean Pierre. Mr. Speaker, forest fires are having a major impact on Quebec's forestry industry. It's too early to assess and evaluate the losses, but it's already too late to guarantee our producers a rapid return to the activities that would protect jobs. The Bloc Québécois has proposed solutions, along with the Association Québécoise des Entrepreneurs Forestiers. We need to compensate for loss of equipment, including and especially the cost of insurance deductibles. We need to take insur inspiration from pandemic programs to cover fixed costs and to offer a wage subsidy to keep workers in their jobs. Will the government work with us to implement these solutions? The Honourable Minister. Very important question, and we know that the wildfires that have been impacting right across the country are having an impact on, on, on residents, but also businesses in every part of the country. Through working with our provincial partners, the Disaster Financial Assistance Arrangement will be there to, su to support those businesses and communities for eligible expenses, and we also know that we have to invest in future resiliency in our provinces as well. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker. Obviously, if forestry producers are worried, then their employees are worried too. Seasonal workers in forestry-related sectors are all at a standstill with no prospect of returning to work. And they're worried because all those hours lost today are hours that employment insurance will blame them for not having accumulated by the end of the season. The government is showing openness and flexibility for the time being, and we applaud that. But will the government extend the reference period to 104 weeks to prevent the hours missed due to the fires from placing our workers in precarious employment situation in the fall? Monsieur le Président, come on, collègue. Mr. Speaker, as my colleague just said, we are here for all provinces, including Quebec. Of course, we are working with workers' associations and with employers to ensure that workers have the support that they need during this very difficult time. 
We are working with Service Canada in order to ensure that workers have access to EI, and we will continue that. Cypress Hills Grasslands. Mr. Speaker, as we start summer, the Liberals are going to rain on everyone's Canada Day Parade. You see, on July 1st, Canadians will be forced to pay a second carbon tax. Combined with the first carbon tax, gas prices will go up eventually to 61 cents per litre higher. But it doesn't stop there. They're going to raise both carbon taxes so that every Saskatchewan household has to pay another $3,000 per year. Wow. After eight years of this Liberal government, Canadians cannot afford another tax increase by this government. No. Will the Liberals listen to Canadians and cancel both of their failed carbon taxes before July 1st? Here, here. Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, again, if the member opposite wants to talk about clean fuel regulations, let's do that. I thought the party opposite was really interested in technological solutions to climate change. Well, let's talk about how clean fuel regulations help to drive clean technologies. That means better biofuels, developing through um, hydrogen, all of which supports our economy of the future. It's very important that we take the steps. It's not just one thing in isolation. It's the fact that we have a clean fuels fund that helps to support people. We would have an all-encompassing framework that covers all sectors of our economy so that we can plan for a strong economy in the future. The Honourable Member for Cumberland, Colchester. The Nova Scotia forestry <laughs> industry employs thousands. This is a traditional way of life and a major employer for rural communities. Atlantic yeah. Canadians have been affected by, by this carbon tax by more than any other region in the country, and now they are implementing a second carbon tax. Farmers and fishers are exempt from the carbon tax, but not foresters, and they demand equal treatment, Mr. Speaker. Atlanta Canadian Premiers have spoken out against the 61, 61 cent a litre carbon tax. Why is the Liberal government hell bent on punishing Atlanta Canadians and the foresters with a $33 billion industry, Mr. Speaker? Good job. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. It is certainly important that parties around this House actually have a plan to address climate change, but we must do so in a manner that is affordable. The price on pollution is done in a manner where 8 out of 10 Canadian families get more money back than they actually pay. It is an effective manner for, for addressing climate change, and I would tell you that one of the political parties in this House, in the platform that they ran on in 2021, says, and I quote, we recognize that the most efficient way to reduce our emissions is to use pricing mechanisms. That was the Conservative Party of Canada. The Honourable Member for Pont Jacques-Cartier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this government hasn't been in power for eight years. It has been making people believe that it's working to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Their solution is now to add a second carbon tax. But they say, oh, it won't affect Quebec. Mr. Speaker, that is not the truth. This second Liberal carbon tax will cost Quebecers over $430 more. This government must stop taxing and must start taking effective action for the environment to get real results. Will it cancel this second carbon tax, which is scheduled to take effect on July 1st? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, first, I'd like to say that when we take stock of our GHG emissions, they are decreasing. Our action is having an effect and will continue to lower our emissions. But that's not all. When it comes to clean fuels, clean fuels will also help the economy. So we are doing two things at the same time. There's regulation, but there's also additional support to use clean fuels, and that's very important for our economy as we transition toward a green future. Green City. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The last two years have put our transportation sector through a lot, from the COVID-19 pandemic to extreme weather to the Russian war on Ukraine. As we head into another busy summer travel season, could the Minister of Transport provide us an update on what our government is doing to support Canadians build and uh, support Canadians and build a strong federal transportation sector? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, my honourable friend is correct. The aviation sector around the world has experienced significant disruptions over the last couple of years, and Canadian workers and travellers felt it here at home. We promise Canadians to take actions on lessons learned. So far, we've strengthened 
passenger protection rights. We are working to modernize CATSA, and today I had the honor of tabling Bill C-52 that will enhance service standards for airports and airlines and enhance transparency. This is great news for Canadians, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to working with my colleagues on advancing this important legislation. The Honourable Member for Montmagny, Lise Le Camouraska, Rivière du Loup. Mr. Speaker, the carbon tax is having an impact across the country, the whole country, even in Quebec, despite what the Minister and the Prime Minister claim. As if that weren't bad enough, the government is going to impose an additional tax, a second tax on carbon, starting July 1st. Quebec families will pay an average of $436 a year for this new measure, which they do not at all need. We know that families are already struggling to make ends meet. So will this Prime Minister show some common sense and drop this new tax? The Honourable Minister of Sport. Mr. Speaker, I'm so disappointed to hear Conservative colleagues from Quebec talk about cancelling carbon pricing, carbon tax because climate change has a cost. There are costs in Quebec and everywhere in Canada, especially those who are currently affected by wildfires. So Conservatives in 2021 campaigned, in fact, on pricing pollution. So they are going back on their word and on their promises. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to fight climate change. I would like to remind the members that when they uh, are reading from a paper, they should not hit the papers. Well, member for Coast of Bay Central, note your name. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, these Liberals have had eight years of blaming everyone and everything for their failures. They failed yet again. This time they failed to release quotas for Northern Cod, East Coast Capelin, Mackerel and Southwestern Nova Scotia hearing on time. Harvesters and processors cannot count on this minister to deliver decisions that, de that their livelihoods depend on. So will this Liberal government stop failing the fishing industry and announce these quotas immediately? The Honourable Minister for Fisheries and Oceans. And my goal is to grow Canada's fish and seafood sector uh, yeah, yeah. and do it in a sustainable way so it is there for the long term and for the next generations. Right uh, Mr. Speaker, the stocks mentioned their decisions have not yet been made and when they are made I will, uh, I will announce them for the member and for all of the fish Canadians. harvesters uh, in, on Eastern Canada. Right yeah. The Honourable Member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Mr. Speaker, my question is directed to the Chair of the Public Safety Committee. Just before question period, members of the committee were informed that the meeting had been cancelled for this afternoon. We were told that all parties had consented to this meeting. None of the opposition parties have consented to this meeting. Wow. I can only think that the reason this meeting has been cancelled on such short notice is to protect the Minister of Public Safety from a Conservative motion calling on him to appear to answer questions about the Bernardo Makes transfer. Sense. Can the, uh, the Chair of the Public Safety Committee tell this House why they are going this far to protect the Minister of Public Safety? Why did they cancel this meeting? Who's going to answer the question? Please stand up. The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, what we've seen, unfortunately, over the last three weeks is a party that is bent on obstructing everything at every turn. Whether or not it's pretending to have technical problems they don't have, or raising uh, phony points of order, or screaming and yelling when others are trying to talk and have the floor, they know very well that the decision in question was made independently by corrections. And what they are covering up is the ability for this House to do its work on behalf of Canadians. Well, Mr. Speaker, we will not be deterred. We will continue the business of this nation. We will adopt the legislation that is needed, and we will be there for Canadians. The Honourable Member from Chateauguay-Lacolle. Mr. Speaker, 
A free and independent press is vital to our democracy. But last week, we found out that 1,300 families have been affected by Bell's layoffs. While online platforms and web giants benefit from access to the Canadian market, they have no responsibility toward our local Canadian artists, creators, and media. This is another example of why we need Bills C-11 and C-18 to ensure that web giants pay their fair share to our local media. Can the Minister of Canadian Heritage tell the House how our government is committed to defending our democracy by supporting our the Honourable Canadian Heritage Minister? Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for Chateauguay-Lacolle for her question and for her absolutely incredible work. C-18 is crucial to save our newsrooms. It's crucial for ensuring that web giants pay their fair share. But every step of the way, Conservative pol politicians have filibustered to block the passage of C-11 and C-18 because they would prefer to defend web giants than to defend Canadians, jobs and a free press. But on this side of the House, we will continue to stand up for democracy. We've always done it, we're doing it today, and we will continue to do it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, rising food prices are putting pressure on families. The Edmonton Food Bank has had to cut the amount of food in their hampers by 25% to meet demand. And 40,000 Albertan kids who get lunch at school will go without once the school rises for the summer. Grocery CEOs are making millions in surplus profits, and this government is doing nothing to help Canadians. Now, while the Prime Minister and the leader of the official opposition have private chefs and fridges full of food, Canadian children are going hungry. When will the Prime Minister finally start tackling corporate greed and implement a windfall tax? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we understand that food security has been on the rise and continue to make investments to support those facing hardships. We've made significant investments for Canadian families through targeted social programs and income supplements like the CCB so that families don't need to make difficult choices when it comes to food and other essential needs. We've made funding available to food banks and charities and will continue to address the work of food insecurity, including delivering on our national school food policy program. Prime Minister highlighted this priority in his mandate letters to both the Minister of F FCSD, Agriculture and Agri-Food. We will continue to work for Canadians, Mr. Speaker. Well, Member for Skeena, Bulkley Valley. Mr. Speaker, the other day I got an email from the owner of Grizzly Gyms, a general store in Topley, B.C. Like hundreds of thousands of other small business owners across this country, he accessed the Canada Business or Emergency Business account to keep his doors open during some of the most difficult times this country has seen. But revenues still haven't fully recovered, and now small businesses are facing the added pressures of inflation and a tight, tight labour market. There's a simple way that the minister can help businesses like Grizzly Gyms, and that's to extend the repayment period for the SEBA business loans by an additional year. Will the minister do this? Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Small Business. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my honourable colleague for that really important question and for uh, his advocacy and all of ours in this House for small businesses across the country. What has been uh, really heartening is to see the almost a million small businesses get through the pandemic with the SIBA loan. We have, of course, been in touch with many of the businesses, some of whom we know are still having a tough time. Um, but uh, throughout this period, I want to thank the Canadian small businesses for their resiliency, and uh, we'll continue to keep working on uh, this very issue. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. C'est tout le temps que nous avons pour la période de questions. This is all the time we have for a question period. Opposition whip is rising on a point of order. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. I've just received a notice that the chair of the Standing Committee on Public Safety has unilaterally cancelled their meeting.